at least a theme or a series of subjects. But I thought it would be good for us to think about the matter of priorities uh, through the course of this year. So my intent is to uh, at least once every month speak uh, with some uh, degree of, of specificity on the various uh, priorities that we have or ought to have with regard to our spiritual uh, walk, our life uh, with God and with one another. I uh, want to begin with a very general way uh, this week looking at the context or the text of 2 Corinthians <coughs> chapter 16, chapter 20, and verse 6, where it was said to Hezekiah by the prophet Isaiah, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Now that particular context was in the midst of a great time of turmoil in the life of the nation of Judah and certainly in the life of Hezekiah the king. Uh, chapter 20 begins with, in those days, and it speaks about the time that uh, Sennacherib uh, and the Assyrians had surrounded Israel and were threatening to overthrow, overrun the entire nation. And so we find in verse chapter 20 is a, a, sub, a subtext of the events that are going on uh, with regard to uh, uh, Sennacherib and uh, the threat of destruction by the Assyrians. But the phrase, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live, is our theme. In other words, God says to the king, get your affairs in order. In other words, there are things that need to be straightened up in your life and, and, uh, and, and in your, your, your family or whatever. That uh, These are things that need uh, your immediate attention. And so I got to thinking about that, that statement, set your house in order for you shall die and not live. And I thought about it in two different ways. First, I thought about it from the context of what if, what if you were told, what if you were told that you would die in the year 2020. In other words, what if there was what if there was some something that were happened to you in some physical way? And I guess you know, think about I think about my mom, and I think about you know, you get news that you've never that you know you never anticipate, and you don't know what the end of it will be. And of course, uh, my dad got that same got that same news in 1996, not long after uh, we moved here, and he was told expressly. He said he was told. You shall die and not live. And so I thought about, you know, what do people do when they get when they get such uh, news that they're told you're going to die and not live? What are the things that they would normally do or need to do? And then I thought about it in the broader context of the truth of the matter is that unless the Lord comes soon, all of us are going to die. And not live. David makes a statement in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 2, I go the way of all the earth. In other words, I'm about to die. Just like everything that's ever lived before me and everything that will live after me, I'm going to die. And so we can think about this in two different ways. Either we can think about it in the context of what would I do if I were given the word that I would die this year, or what should I do? Or be doing, knowing that I'm going to die, whether it be this year or in some subsequent year. So I thought about so what are some things that people think about when when they die. In other words, if, for example, when, when people are given, I think this is, generally speaking, when people are given the word that you will die and not live, then that has a that has a way of taking all of the noise out of the way and focusing our attention on the things that are truly important. The peripheral matters are no longer of any consequence. There are some things that are extremely important to us at those particular times. So I want to think about those in a physical way and in a spiritual way this morning. So I thought about this. And you talk about setting things in order. If you were told to set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Number one, would you spend some time, would you need to set your family in order? Would you set your family in order? For example, would you need to repair some family 
division. Is there someone in your family uh, with whom you are estranged that if you were given the word that you shall die and not live, is there someone that you would reach out to? Is there someone that you would want to talk to, to, to repair some, some uh, chasm, some schism, some division between you and that person? Now, even though David was not given a death sentence in 2 Samuel 13, there was a schism between David and Absalom. Because Absalom had killed Amnon for his treacherous deeds against his half-sister Tamar. And then Absalom fled, and David just was content to let him be gone. And he was eventually, in chapter 14, rebuked by a woman who was prompted to do so by Joab in order to get David to understand, you don't need this continual rift between you and Absalom. This thing needs to be resolved. Now, David, in some measure, did resolve the matter. But he did not resolve it completely. David said, you can, let the, you can let him come home, but he is not to see my face. And so there was, a partial, uh, there was a partial repair, but not a total reconciliation. And I'm reminded of a statement that the woman made to David that had been sent, uh, that had been sent by, uh, by Joab. And here's what she said. She says, for we will surely die and become like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. And she was trying to emphasize to David that you will die. And this matter, when you die, will not be, get, will not be able to be, get, you know, in other words, when you pour water out on the ground, you don't get it back. And she was trying to emphasize to David the need to repair his relationship with his son, Absalom. Unfortunately, he only took that repair part part way, and it ended up being a very treacherous situation for David. But if you were told to set your house in order, would you need to repair a family division? With regard to your family, would you rearrange your schedule? Would you rearrange your schedule? Would you work more or work less? Would you work more or work less? You know, it's been said, nobody ever said on his deathbed, I wish I'd spent more time at the office, or I had spent more time at work. But then at the same time, you hear people say, well, if I got this, I'd quit my job, and I'd go do this, 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 and this. Well, that wouldn't be a very wise decision either, would it? Look, if somebody told me that I had one year to live, you know what I'd do between now and then? I'd do what I'm doing right now. I'd keep my job, and I'd continue to preach. I can see Shannon Bird. He he get on that he get on that package card as long as he why because just because you get a death sentence doesn't mean you you still don't have responsibilities to your family or or, or to or to others. Now, but the point is, would there be some things within that overall context that you would do differently? Would you work more or work less? How about this? Would you worship more or less? Faced with the reality of your own mortality, would you spend more time pursuing the things of God or less? What about this? Open your Bibles to the book of 2 Kings chapter 2. I already referenced this text a little bit earlier with uh, uh, verse 2 where uh, 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 in 1 Kings where David said, I said 2 Kings, it should say 1 Kings, where David said, I go the way of all the earth. But look at verse 1. 1 Kings 2 and verse 1. Now the days of David drew near that he should die. And look here. And he charged Solomon. In other words, he gave Solomon some, some explicit instructions. Would you have some final instructions for your family if you were told that you were going to die and not live? By the way, note that first and foremost, in verses 1 through 4, the first thing that David charged Solomon to do was to be faithful to God. 
If you were told that you would die and not live, would you need to charge your family to remain faithful to God? Verses 5 through 9. If you were told that you would die and not live, do you have unfinished business that needs to be attended to? David gave Solomon some explicit instructions here in verse 5. He said, you know what Joab did to me and what he did to the two commanders of the armies of Israel, to Abner, a, 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 to whom he killed, shed blood, a, a war in time of peace. And then verse 7, but show kindness, kindness to the sons of Barzillai, the Gileadite. And let them be of those who eat at your table, for they came to me when I fled from your from Absalom, your brother. And then he goes on to talk about Shimei. But David had some unfinished business at the time of his death, and he charged he charged his son Solomon uh, to uh, finish his business. And then I thought about this: the last thing under number one. What kind what kind of legacy? Would you leave your family? If you were told that you would die and not live, what kind of legacy would you leave with your family? Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. If you've not lived your life in diligent service to God, and you are going to die in one month, it is too late to leave a legacy of faithfulness. Because see, a legacy, a legacy is something that is built up over the course of time. And in first, uh, first uh, uh, Kings 15, we read about Abijah, who was the son of Rehoboam, who was the son of Solomon, who was the son of David. Now David left his kingdom to Solomon. And we know that Solomon, even as wise as he was, did not leave a good legacy for his children. That Rehoboam was not wise like his father. And he had not been given proper raising and proper instruction. And then when Rehoboam died, then Abijah became the king. And the Bible says that Abijah walked in all the sins of his father. But listen to what it says in verse 5. But God would not take the kingdom from him. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just paraphrase this. Because of the legacy of his father David. That's what he said. And what does it say specifically? That David did all that God commanded him except for the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Now look. David's sin was not forgotten. It was not forgotten by the people. It was not forgotten by God. But David's sin did not mar his legacy. His sin did not mar his legacy. What was David's legacy? A thousand years later in Acts 13, he was a man after God's own heart. It'd be too late to leave a legacy if you've not been living for the Lord. But it's not too late to try to build one if you've not been building. Leave a legacy of faithfulness for your family. Number two, would you set your friends in order? Now I said set them in order, not put them in their place. Would you set your friends in, for example, would you encourage someone to follow God that was not serving the Lord? You know, David said in Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 5, he said, I ache in my heart for my Jewish brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. And he said, I wish myself accursed for their sake. Well, David never could, David, Paul never could get away from the idea that most of his Jewish brethren had rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. What did he say? My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Romans 10 and verse 1. 
Paul wanted his Jewish brethren to accept Christ and to obey Christ and be saved by Christ. It was something that was first and foremost in, 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 his, in his mind and in his heart. Is there someone that you know that needs to obey the gospel, that, need, that you would encourage if you'd been told to set your house in order for you shall die and not live? Would you encourage someone to come back to the Lord? Friend or family? Is there somebody that you know that if, if, given, if given an opportunity that you would say you need to come back to the Lord? It reminds me of a story that Brother Winkler used to tell. And it, so far as I know, it's just a preacher story. It's not true. But he talked about a man, he talked about a man who lay on his deathbed. And he had two sons. He said one, he said one was a faithful member of the body of Christ and the other was not. And as his boy stood beside his bed, he said to one, he said to the first son, the faithful son, he said, son, he says, I'll see you in the by and by. And he said to the other son, son, goodbye. And the second son asked his father, he says, why, why did you say, why did you say that to, the, to my brother that you'll see him in the by and by, but to me you said goodbye? He says, because you are not right with God. And if things continue as they are right now, I will never see you again. Is there someone that you would encourage to come back to the Lord, if you were if you were told, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Here's one I think is very important to think about. If you were told you shall die and not live, we're still here in front of number two. Would you continue to be bitter about past slights? Or deeds, or would you find a place in your heart to forgive? The last letter that Paul ever wrote was Second Timothy, and I don't know how much this had weighed on his mind. But when you get to verse sixteen, he says, "At my first defense, no man stood by me." They all forsook me. But what did he say? May it not be reckoned to him. May it not be reckoned to him. Seems as though Paul may have struggled with that over the course of some period of his life. That after all he had done for so many people, that nobody stood with him. He said, but like, may the Lord not lay that to their charge. And you think about how all of Jesus' own apostles forsook him and fled. And Peter denied him. And yet Jesus found place in his heart to forgive. He was not going to allow bitterness to overcome those who had been unfaithful to him. Would you be bitter about some past slight? Or would you find it in your heart to forgive? Number three. Would you need to set your finances in order? Now, that's another thing that people do when, when they're faced with their own mortality is that they make sure they have all, or they should make sure that they have all their financial affairs in order. Would you settle your accounts? Or would you die and leave them to somebody else? You know, what kind of person would what kind of person would put the burden in their own family? You know, with, with their own with their own financial misdealing. Ask yourself this question. What have I taught my family about my financial obligation to the Lord? What have I taught my family? Aaron Osbrook and I talk not nearly often enough. I love that guy. You remember Aaron held a meeting for us two or three years ago. And we were talking about a thing. He said, he goes, he said, I don't, he goes, I don't like, and I, I, I don't agree with him on this, but, but I understand his point. He said, I don't like it when people give their kids money to put into play. 
He says, because, he says, because too many people think that all they're doing is teaching their kids that's where the money goes. No, you're not really, his idea is you're not really teaching your kids about financial responsibility simply because you gave them a dollar or whatever. Well, when I was a kid, it was a quarter. <laughs> when Walter was a kid, it was a penny. But just because, just because I put money in my child's hands week after week doesn't mean I've taught them anything about their financial responsibility to the Lord. My point is, my thinking is, well, it's a good start. <laughs> you know, it's a good start. But we can disagree on that. But think about it. You know, what kind of instruction have you given your children about their financial obligation to the Lord? That was something that I was always taught. My grandpa taught it. And he taught it to his, his sons and, and my mom, his daughter. And he taught it to me and my mom taught it to me growing up uh, that, that we had a responsibility to be sacrificial in our giving every single Lord's Day. I'll never forget, Ron and I had just married, and had just not just married, but we hadn't been married long. And, and we were working on a budget because we wanted to get a house. We wanted to get out of the apartment and get a house. And, and so we started writing down our budget. We were, we were working with Mom and Freeman, and we are putting everything together. Now, here was what happened. We were putting down our monthly expenses, okay? You know, what we were paying in rent, insurance, gas, etc. But we inadvertently, for our, for our contribution, we put down what we put every week instead of what we give over the course of the month because, because that's the number you know is... Your rent, your rent's 500 a month, so that's the number that comes to your head. Well, we put down our weekly contribution amount instead of the monthly amount. And as soon as my mom saw that, she tore me a new. She said, that's pitiful. She said, you ought to be embarrassed. If that's all you... I started out, no, no, mom, 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 no. That's my fault. That, that's what we give every week, not what we give every month. But see, I've been taught and my mom, wasn't my mom was not afraid to tell me, that's pitiful. You ought to be ashamed. Of, if that's all you give the Lord in a month's time, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. And just to be honest, it probably wasn't even enough, you know, probably wasn't given as, even as I should back then. But that's something that was always, always put into my head. When my grandpa, uh, my grandpa told my two uncles how much they were going to give to the Lord because he employed them. <laughs> And he counted the money. So he knew how much they gave. And he told them, he said, you're going to give at least this much of what I pay you to the Lord every week. Now, I'm sure they did better than that. But the point is, that's always been something that's been very uh, important to my family, at least in my instruction. What have you taught your kids about your financial obligations to the Lord? First Chronicles 22.5, Solomon was given a great example. David prepared abundantly before his death for the building uh, of the temple. Uh, 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8. Uh, you know, we, prepare our, we prepare our family by teaching them what is right. You know, he who uh, 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 does not prepare his family or take care of his own family, 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8, is worse than an infidel and, den and denied the faith. But what if I've not taught my family about their obligation to the Lord. I thought about this statement. Uh, Psalm 116 and verse 12. What shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits towards me? Look, I can never repay the Lord for all he's done for me. Never. You know, as we pray before the contribution, we give back you know, a portion of what is rightfully the Lord. It all belongs to the Lord. But we, we want to be generous. Uh, we want to be generous with it. I thought about this, it, it, thinking about, again, going back to the point of, you know, you shall die and not live. When my dad got, when my dad got his uh, death sentence, he still didn't make any preparations. He didn't make any preparations at all, financial or otherwise. In fact, I, Ron and I went to see him on a Friday, and he died on Sunday, and we signed his will on Saturday. So if my dad had been given ample opportunity to make preparations for his death, and here he is less than 24 hours from death and doesn't have a will. All right? The interesting thing I thought 
that I saw when, because we had a friend in the family at home that was a lawyer, is a still a lawyer, and, uh, and he wrote up a will, and I remember seeing, now listen to this. Now, I want, you to fin- I want you to finish this line for me. The opening line of a will. I, Joseph Todd Clifford, being of what? Sound mind and body. You know what my dad said? I, Joseph Howard Clifford, being of sound mind. Nothing about his body. I never thought about a will reading the way my dad's will read. And it struck me. Being of sound mind. But not of sound mind and body. He hadn't made the preparations that he needed to make. God remembered you in his will. You need to remember him in yours. By the way, I read this statistic in, in preparation in preparation for uh, this lesson. 55% of all Americans die without a will. 55% of all Americans die without a will. And almost 50% die without life insurance. That's an incredible thought for me. Listen, you're not making preparations for your family if you don't have a will. You're not making preparations, and, or unless you're, look, you don't, if you're independently wealthy like Walter, you don't need a will. Right? But if you, don't, if you don't have Walter McKay legacy money, then you need a will. All right? And you need life insurance. I mean, I meant life insurance. Everybody needs a will. But unless you're just independently wealthy, you need life insurance to take care of your family after you're gone. And you need to include the Lord in your will. Like I said, the Lord included you in His will. You include the Lord in, in yours. I have a will, and I also have a final, I have a final statement called final instructions. I have other other instructions on how to handle my affairs uh, in the event of my in the event of my death. In other words, there are things that I have written down that that I think Rhonda needs to know about things that we have and things how things need to be handled. And and the church the church is in those instructions. The church is in those instructions. So. What would you have to do to get your affairs in order with regard to finance? Now, here's the two most important ones, but they won't take long. Do you need to set your faults in order? Do you need to set your faults in order? Because sometimes death reminds us of things that we have pushed to the back of our mind. Things that we should have dealt with or done in time past, and now we have realized that we've not done them. In Genesis chapter 41 and verse 9, when Joseph gave the, the meaning of the dream to the baker and the butler, you remember? The baker, he said, you're going to die. And he did. And the butler, he told, you're going to be restored to your place. And when you are, remember me to the king. And then the butler got his job back, and what happened? He forgot it, didn't he? Two more years went by, and not a word was said. And then the king had a dream, and he didn't know the interpretation of it. And when he heard the king say, I've had a dream, and I don't know what it means, you know what the man said? I remember my faults this day. I remember my faults this day. Death has a way of bringing to our remembrance the things that we should have done that we've not done. In 2 Samuel 12 and verse 13, David said, I have sinned. I have sinned. Do you have any sins in your life that need to be dealt with? That need to be remembered? That need to be repented of? That need to be Forgive me. I think about Daniel chapter 4, verses 37 and 38, after Nebuchadnezzar had lived like an animal, living out in the pasture, eating grass, 
obviously out of his mind. And he says, I came to my senses. I came to my senses. And I extol the God of heaven. You need to remember. Do you need to remember or set your faults in order? And then lastly, this one. Do you need to set your faith in order? Do you need to set your faith in order? In Acts 26 and verse 20, Paul said, in, in talking before uh, 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 Agrippa, he spoke about that the Gentiles need to repent and turn to God and do works that are worthy of repentance. And then Agrippa said to Paul in verse 28, Almost you persuade me to be a Christian. But what did Paul say in response to that? What did he say in response to that? I would to God that not only you, but everybody that is in the sound of my voice was almost and altogether, even as I am this day, <coughs> except for these chains. In other words, Paul wished for everyone in the sound of his voice to have the relationship with God that he had. Could you say that to your family? I wish that you were almost and all together even as I am. You know, Paul said, I fought a good fight, I finished the course. By the way, this was in view of his own death. I'm ready to be poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. Can you say that to your family? Can you say, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me in that day, and not to me only, but also to all of them that love us appear. You may not have been, you may not have a death sentence. I hope you don't. Ultimately, we all have one, but you know what I mean. But I do know one thing. The time to prepare is now. The time to prepare is now. Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. For the night comes when no man can work. And the wise man said to Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10, Whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For there is no work or device in the grave where, thou art, where you are going. There's no work or device in the grave where you are going. The, if the cemetery is too late to prepare. But while we're on this side of the sod, let us do all that we can to set our house in order. By the way, all the things that we've talked about this morning that people do before they die are things that we all need to be doing every day while we live. In other words, the prospect of death doesn't change anything that we've talked about this morning. Is that right? That's right. So if you need to make preparations, if you need to set your house in order, <clears throat> in view of the fact that you will die and not live, that you'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ and receive the things done in your body, whether good or bad, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, and we encourage you to do whatever is necessary. To repent of sins and ask for the prayer of the church, to obey the gospel and be baptized for the remission of your sins. If we can assist you in any way, we want you to come. Together we stand and sing this song together. Let us pray.